Good morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Pasqual Show brought to you by JohnPLA.com as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Also by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. By Budweiser and, of course, Castro Motor Oil. I haven't been with you for about nine days or so, but glad to be with you talking baseball, sports, and unifying America. As a reminder, if you're interested, want to be part of the program, you give the show a call at 732-364-3598. You can comment, whether it's Facebook Live, Periscope, uh, YouTube Premiere, anything that's on your mind, like I said, in the world of baseball, sports, and unifying America. If you saw the caption or the uh, little description of the show today, we're going to touch on a couple different topics. I'm going to talk about baseball. and then, Listen, I mean, obviously... If you're a Major League Baseball fan or a football fan and you watch your team, which looked like it was dead all of a sudden, play really well over a good period of time, there's, it's completely understandable. As a fan, you get giddy. And when I talk about this as it applies to the New York Mets in baseball, I'm going to bring up something historical that kind of goes back and forth and what it's like to be a fan of this franchise because if you're not a fan of the New York Mets, maybe you don't really understand you know, how the highs can be so high, but the lows are probably worse than being a fan of any other sports team. So we'll touch on that in a little bit. I also want to talk about the word gate, which if you've heard me speak about it before, I think it's an absolute waste of a word of an English language. Um, Antonio Brown, we're going to talk about him in a little bit, but how the NFL, if it wants to stay tough, it can actually transcend the sport and can send a message to the players that think that they're better than the sport. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, get a question whether or not the known argument that's thrown out there against the Mets and their ownership and this comment that says the Will Ponds are cheap. And I'm going to throw a little rebuttal in there. We could go back and forth. Like I said, the show belongs to you. Anything on your mind in the world of baseball sports and unify in America. So um, I don't want to be time contingent when it comes to talking about, hey, how many games have you won over the past week? What happened last night? So it's pretty understandable. The New York Mets, a team that was expected, if you have Watch the July 31st show when it comes with me talking about buyers and sellers. Was expected to be a team that was just going to play out the stretch of games. A little bit of hope was put in there when they made a trade and acquisition of Marcus Stroman as opposed to trading guys like Zach Wheeler, Noah Syndergaard, and obviously other pieces. And obviously they've gone out there and they have they've gone on a run. They've played great baseball over the course of the past couple weeks. And if you're a fan, as we hit what we'll call the opening point of the PBS, brought to you, of course, St. Aloysius Church, Two Ways, One Passion, Food Truck, the whole thing, it, there's reasons to be excited. And teams have the ability over the course of a full 162-game season to do some good things and some bad things things. There's going to be good stretches of baseball for everybody. The teams that have the best record in baseball, you can look at the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Houston Astros, they're going to have some stretches, or maybe they've had some stretches where they haven't, haven't played the best baseball. And that's what happens when you play 162 games in a season. Now, if, if you're believing in the New York Mets, which I think you have every right to, you look at the National League wildcard picture, certainly it could be any one of about six or seven teams could get one of those two spots, and he could even expand it if you want to include the likes of the Arizona Diamondbacks and the San Francisco Giants and the Cincinnati Reds. Remember, the Reds were aggressive. They went out there and they traded for Trevor Bauer. You never know. Any one of these teams has a run like the Mets have had recently, like the Giants had within the last month, then you we can't look at the two wild card teams and say, hey, it's definitive. No, this team's going to get there. That team's going to be there. It's going to be a matter of two or three teams. It could be any one of a number of five to seven or maybe eight teams. So when you're on, as a fan, a good stretch 
of baseball or football, you want to enjoy it. And you think of a franchise like the New York Mets, and you're stuck with a couple different feelings that you have if you're a Mets fan. Because it, there's one side of it which is well public and well spoken about the misery and the suffering of being a Mets fan, especially when you're you're playing little brother to the New York Yankees and their 27 World Series championships. And the fact that year in and year out, the Yankees are always going to be good. It doesn't matter how you are. You just know that the New York Yankees are going to have a good baseball team. Nothing that they touch doesn't turn into gold. And they win every single year. Now, I understand it's been 10 years since the Yankees have won a World Series. Fans are getting a little frustrated because they, you know, they haven't had this much of a gap between winning a World Series too often in their 100-plus year history in Major League Baseball as a franchise. But you know being a, a Yankees fan is good. Your team's probably going to get the postseason every year. Your team has the financial resources to go out there and get whatever it needs. It's expected to go World Series or bust every year. Very few times in the history of the New York Yankees franchise are they willing to give up a year. Now, you're a fan of the Mets, and you have to deal with that. You have to deal with that aspect of the big brother in town, the team that is expected to win. And even if you do well, the city, unless you're a diehard Mets fan, Mets fan like yourself, doesn't really care. The Mets are never going to be embraced in New York City like the Yankees and their history, like the New York Giants, even like the New York Knicks and the New York Rangers. Those are really the four iconic teams of the city of New York. Now, there's obviously other teams that are there, but they pop, play more of a role of a little brother than some of the big-time teams. Now, you can talk about the misery of what it's like to be a Mets fan. You, when things go wrong, they're terrible. Let's be serious. You got the 1962 Mets. You got the Mets of the late 70s into the early 80s. You got the Mets of 1992, the worst team money can buy in a transition they went from being bad to good there. In the early 2000s, you got you know the Art Howe Mets and Steve Phillips, the second worst money team you know team money can buy in 2002. You got Omar Minaya spending money on the wrong players in the latter part of the first decade of the 2000s, leading to another rebuild, Bernie Madoff, the whole thing. So it's easy to talk about negative things when it comes to the New York Mets, but one thing that doesn't get brought up enough is there is a balance between misery, dread, and magic. And you can talk about magic runs that particular franchises have. And there's plenty of examples. If you're a fan of just about any team, especially a team that's won before, you can talk about everything that happened within that magic. But the Mets were known as the Amazing Mets in 1969. Now, listen, I'm not bringing any news to you. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. The New York Mets were one of the worst baseball teams in history from 1962 to 1968. Did not get off to a dominant start in 1969. And all of a sudden, ran out a string in the second half of the season where they won a lot more games than they lost. Won the National League East in the first year of divisional play. Got themselves past the Atlanta Braves and then, of course, past the Baltimore Orioles in five games to win the World Series. The Mets in 1973 end up making the playoffs with 82 wins. A team that looked like it was dead in the end of July. Went on this you gotta believe run. Made it to the seventh game of the World Series before losing to the dynasty of the Oakland Athletics at that time. 1986, maybe not an amazing season. Maybe not a dramatic season. Maybe not a come from behind season. That was a good baseball team. But you go to 2015, Wilma Flores crying. The Mets only a couple games over 500. The frustration is mountain amongst Mets fans. Sandy Alderson has been the general manager of a team that has done nothing for the better part of four and a half years. Flores cries. They get Cespedes. They go on this ridiculous run in August and September, win the division, make it to the World Series. 2016, another season that looked like it was dead in the water. Hovering around 500. 
They go out there, make a nice run in August and September, and make it to the wild card game. Of course, they lost to the Giants that year. A little bit of a disappointing finish. Maybe one of these things does not belong with the other when you're talking about 69, 73, and even 2015. But what team in sports has so much of these individual underdog stories? You don't see it happen too often. You can talk about individual instances of this team that comes out of nowhere. I think of the 1914 Boston Braves, which don't get spoken about anywhere near enough. Probably the most miracle team in all professional sports history. A team that was bad. A a team that was dead last in the National League. Going nowhere with absolutely very little bit of talent, if any at all. And they go on this ridiculous run and then they go up there against Connie Mack's machine. The Philadelphia Athletics, who had won World Series in 1910, 1911, and 1913. You, you think when it comes to odds and betting, if you put money on the Boston Braves, you probably won a lot of money because they were not expected to win the World Series. But what team in all of sports has several instances of miracle runs that have started in teams that you didn't think were any good? You put the 69 Mets with the 73 Mets, the 2015 Mets, and the 2016 Mets. If you're not sure of what type of pattern I'm trying to show to you, look at what those teams were in the first half of each one of those seasons. And tell me there isn't a pattern. Look at the Mets in the first half of this season. At the All-Star break, 10 games under 500, 11 under 500 after they lost the first game after the break to the Miami Marlins. Is there something in the air? But most importantly, what team in professional sports has a ridiculous amount of balance between dread and misery and magic that you see in the air? Something like pixie dust that gets sprinkled over this franchise and they go from being a terrible team in the first half of the year into the month of July and the early part of August to all of a sudden no point where they can't lose. It happened in 69, it happened in 73, it happened in 2015 and 16. And it seems like, at least right now, it looks like there's a little magic in the air right now. And I don't know what to make of it. I mean, maybe next time I do a show, the Mets will have lost a handful of games in a row. Whatever. But there's something maybe in the air that impacts this team more than others. And like I said, you can talk about the misery Mets. You can talk about the dreadful Mets. You can talk about the worst times in franchise history, which seems like Within every decade, we happen to go through one of the worst times being a fan in the history of this franchise. But this team doesn't win conventionally. And when we talk about winning conventionally, I don't mean individual games. How many instances or how many examples do you have of a team winning a whole at a ridiculous pace, playing 900 ball over the last 15 games? How many times has that happened to one team? When you look at the rest of the season and you say it was crap, when you remember that team being in the playoffs or doing something in the playoffs, you're not going to believe that they were under 500 as late in the season as they were. So when you're out there being miserable as a Mets fan when things are going bad, think about this balance that gets thrown in there because you were gifted 69, you were gifted 73, you were gifted 15 and 16, Four examples of teams that were not going anywhere, that were under 500 after significant stretches of games over the course of the regular season. And all of a sudden, something switched. And I don't know if 2019 is another example of it, but I think Mets fans, when they are being miserable and critical during bad stretches of time, aren't appreciating the gifts that they're given in certain times. Now, I'm going to transition to talk about the Wilpons for a second because I think there, there's a lot that's said that's true when it comes to the Mets' ownership. Fred Wilpon, Jeff Wilpon, Saul Katz, anybody that's running the franchise right now, is not going to be mistaken for Mark Cuban. It's not going to be mistaken for the Steinbrenner family. It's not going to be mistaken for an ownership group that says, hey, listen, we'll spend every last dime that we have. All we care about is winning. And I think a lot of that makes sense. A lot of that 
is points that you hear thrown out there millions and millions of times by irate and frustrated and disgusted fans. The Wilpons, you look at a city of New York, maybe the spending from putting money into their payroll and making sure that they're paying their players the most amount of money and bringing in the players that they need to win can all be questioned at certain points at a time. Obviously, they were stuck with the Madoff problems of the early part of the 2010s. They got past it. They hired Sandy Alderson. They managed to keep themselves, I don't know, in existence for a couple of years where they didn't have the ability to add any more contracts. But when the Mets started winning in 2015 and 2016, they added payroll. They added more payroll in 2017 and 2018, years that ended up not working out for them. Now, you could question what type of investments are made in which players. And you could say, hey, they made a mistake with the Robinson Cano Edwin Diaz trade with, with Brody Van Wagen. And you could question some of the moves that Sandy Alderson made, maybe giving all that money to Yolanda Cespedes, the right contract, the trade that Omar Minaya made with the extension that he gave to Johan Santana. You could say there's a little bit of uh, bad luck in there. It seems like every player the Mets commit a ton of money to ends up failing ends up not becoming a big-time player, ends up being a shell of themselves prior to them signing that big contract. But the Mets do spend money. And I know people are going to be pissed off for me saying that because there's people that have it entrenched in their head that the Wilpons absolutely refuse to spend money. And you can talk about the trade that they made with the Giants to get Joe Panic and pay him the league minimum, but... They decided to cut Adeni Echeverria, a guy who was due a $1 million roster bonus in, what, 24 hours. And you can say that's bad optics. You can say that looks bad for the franchise. But what exactly is Adeni Echeverria bringing to the table that makes you think that this was such a big loss, not having to pay him that million dollars? Now, yes, the Wilpons are the ones that saved that million dollars. But it's not like Adeni Echeverria is an upgrade over Joe Paddock. He might be, he might not be, but if he is an upgrade over Joe Paddock, that means Joe Paddock sucks. That means Joe Paddock is no better than he was during his time with the Giants when they DFA'd him. So sometimes I think fans take their frustration out and listen, the years and years of frustration of being a fan, I get it, I feel it. I feel it just like any other fan does, but sometimes we misdirect it and start making statements that aren't necessarily true. The Mets, sure. Their payroll, where it stands around now, is about, what, 13th or 14th in all of Major League Baseball? It's not like that they're willing to spend above and beyond. They don't have Bryce Harper. They don't have Manny Machado, which, by the way, look at Bryce Harper and Manny Machado and the teams that they play for. It's not like those teams are given a free ticket to the World Series. The Padres look like they, they need a major run to even get back in the playoff race. And the Phillies are struggling. The Phillies are at a crossroads that if they don't start playing better baseball, they may start to get passed. So it's not like the signing of Machado and Harper and the 30, you know, 20 something to $30 million a year that they're going to be making has made those particular franchises any better. And there's nothing that would say that the Mets had signed either one of them that they would be in a better position than they are right now. You could question plenty of moves that the Mets had made. But I have a hard time with this narrative that's thrown out there that the Wilpons are cheap. That the Wilpons will not spend money when it's needed. I think they operate the team more like a business than, let's say, the Steinbrenners do. Steinbrenners expect to win. They expect to have a certain amount of of competitiveness to them. They go to win every year. The Mets, and I think the Wilpons, and this is probably the one fair point or critique or counter-argument that I can make in what I just said, that the Wilpons are more about, hey, show me something. The Mets showed them, or were at least were competitive enough in 2015 for the Wilpons to say, all right, let's spend. Coming off of a World Series appearance in 2016, uh, in 2015, they were willing to spend in 2016. Things didn't go well in 2017. 
Why are you going to add to that? Things didn't go well in 2018. Why are you going to add to that? So they operate more as, as things as a business than a lot of other owners do. But I don't think they're cheap. I think it's a little bit unfortunate, a, uh, I don't know, a misinterpretation. Do they spend ridiculously? No, they're not cheap. This copyright broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or other use of pictures, descriptions, and accounts of the show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPielli.com and JohnPielli LLC, is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of programs, such as by charging, admission for its showing is similarly prohibited. Mike makes a good point. Last night was the best night in years for the Mets. And, and I think, you know, it, it certainly the game will be a Mets classic for years upon years. A uh, couple times where it looked like the Mets were dead, down 3 nothing against Steven Strasburg, coming back, you know, the Alonzo home run, the J.D. Davis home run. Then they're down again, three runs in the ninth. Frazier probably hits one of the biggest home runs in franchise history. You know, you, I heard some comparisons to a Piazza-like moment in 2000. You know, when he hits that home run to ignite the comeback. But I also think of the Alonzo home run last week against the Marlins, kind of in similar fashion to finish off a comeback. And you talk about a team that, if you're a fan of the Mets, you sure as hell better believe. And I believe you should. I believe you should have that excitement. I believe you should look day in and day out and think that this team can compete with the likes of any one of these teams in a wild card, whether it's the Nationals or the, the Phillies or the Brewers or the Cardinals or anybody else that you want to throw in the mix. The Mets are as good as any of those teams. Now you'll find out when the Mets play a team like the Braves, I just think the Braves are a lot deeper than they are. When the Mets play the Dodgers, I look at the Dodgers and unfortunately don't look at the Dodgers and, and Listen, I don't, I don't think the Mets, from a roster standpoint, have what the Dodgers have. But if the Mets continue to win, build confidence, build momentum, maybe com you know complete their roster from within. In other words, their relievers, who you know some some of the guys that we dread coming into the game, all of a sudden get it together. Edwin Diaz starts pitching well. Juris Familia somehow figures it out, and maybe this is a different baseball team. But you have every right, if you're a Mets fan, to be giddy, to be excited for what you see, especially after watching the game from last night. And like I said, when I do the show, I don't want to be time sensitive to things that happened yesterday or last week. But you're going to look at the game on August 8th, 2019, as one of the most incredible games in history. Victory taken from the hands of defeat. And like I said, if you're a Mets fan, you got every right to be excited about it. We're going to talk about this because I think this is a major thing that has to be brought up in the world of sports. You have certain aspects when we're talking about players, and players are all different. Uh, Jagger18 says hello from Boston. What's going on? Uh, Sarah Fim says hello, hello. Hope you guys are enjoying the show. Anybody that's listening, I hope you like what you see. Anything that's on your mind, like I said, in the world of baseball, sports, and unifying America, please bring up. There's a power that exists with athletes. And athletes are, right now, you talk about the generation that we live in, the privilege that people have. Um, it's not as much in, in for, in for the exception of different of certain instances and maybe certain um, you know regions and inner cities. There might be a little bit tougher of a development or a growth where kids could have rough youths. There's no question about it. This stuff exists. There's kids that have a hard time growing up and a hard time achieving anything, no matter how talented and how smart that they are. But we know, as I've spoken a number of times on a show about, a couple paths that a kid could have that could rise themselves to the top and allow them to be compensated very well are skills in sports, skills in being able to play music, and being able to be lucky and get that big break in the world of Hollywood and become an actor or an actress. Or if you're blessed with beauty and you become a model, you have a chance to you know 
generate a ridiculous amount of income and that may have very little or nothing to do with the way that you were brought up or what your parents had to go through. Your parents could have nothing, but if you're blessed with one of those gifts, you have a chance to be compensated early on in your life and certainly through the early and latter parts of your adult life. And the reason I bring this up is because we've hit a point in the world of sports and I think you could talk about how it applies to the pro football player where you're seeing this entitlement you're seeing this I guess this expectation that the sport can't live without you and if you saw in the title of my show you know what I'm going to get into and talk about now Antonio Brown basically feels like he is so much better than the sport of football he feels like Pro football, in a time where it is most prosperous, is making billions and billions of dollars right now, somehow can't survive without him. And I think that's insane. That's a ridiculous thought for anybody to be so pompous and arrogant to think that. And Antonio Brown doesn't have to say it for me to believe it. Antonio Brown is going to try to tell you try to tell the National Football League that he's going to wear the helmet of his choice or he's going to retire. And if I'm the NFL, I'm going to say, you're going to wear the helmet that we approve or you're not going to play. You're not going to use the helmet of your choice because we deem it being unsafe. It's a safety issue. It's not a power trip that the league's trying to put over Antonio Brown. And if Antonio Brown thinks he's more holier than thou and is going to threaten to walk away from the sport, the Raiders and the National Football League and the commissioner and the Players Association should just let him walk. Because the sport's going to be just as fine without Antonio Brown. The sport would be fine without Tom Brady. It would be fine without Aaron Rodgers. It would be fine without Odell Beckham. Name any player in the National Football League. Le'Veon Bell sat out last season. And the NFL made billions and billions of dollars. If Ezekiel Elliott wants to sit out this season, the NFL is still going to do fine. And if Antonio Brown wants to make this all about himself and wants to basically mandate that he gets the helmet of his choice, even though it's deemed unsafe, the National Football League should strong arm, should prohibit him from using a helmet that's not safe. And if he decides that he wants to retire, you know what he could do? He could go out there and try to have a job like the rest of the people in America. The rest of the people that weren't given the gifts to be an athlete or an artist or an actor. Because he's taken the lifestyle that he has been gifted for granted. And I think that's a terrible job. This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer that costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive Beachwood Aging produces a taste of smoothness and drinkability you'll find in no beer at any cost. So the word gate gets thrown out there. And I mentioned this a couple times on a show, but every single time something happens. You know, now with Antonio Brown, they want to call it, call it Helmet Gate. They want to call everything that's a controversy something gate. And I don't know if it's a generational thing. Maybe there's a whole group of people that have grown up in this generation that believe that the word gate means some kind of controversy. And the bottom line is it doesn't. It, steam, it stems from the word Watergate, which was known obviously, as a major scandal in the history of the United States, which resulted in Richard Nixon resigning as president of the United States in 1972, but was in reference to a hotel. Watergate was a hotel. The word G-A-T-E as a suffix means nothing in regards to what it's perceived as. So once again, we can take that word and say anything gate, anything gate. I get involved in some kind of controversy, you could call it Pielli gate. And I won't allow you to do that because the misuse of a word that doesn't have a freaking definition. And I'm sorry, I had to get that off my chest. I know I've mentioned it a couple times on the show, but it's something that frustrates the hell out of me when we take parts of the English language 
and we basically make up words to mean something that they don't even mean. Gate is a suffix from Watergate, which was a freaking hotel. Castrol provides maximum protection against viscosity and thermal breakdown. Castrol, engineered for today's smaller cars. Quick recap of the show today, and I do appreciate everybody tuning in. Spoke a little bit about the New York Mets and how much it sucks to be a Mets fan. You can be a little giddy after the run that they've been on over the last couple weeks. Over the franchise history, there has been a balance between what we call dread and magic. As much as it sucks to be a Mets fan at certain times, there's no other team in professional sports that has miracle runs in the middle of the season or towards the end of the season as often as the New York Mets have. All you got to do is look at the years of 1969, 1973, 2015, 2016, and if God blesses them, maybe 2019. The owners, the Wilpons, perceived very much as being cheap. They may not go the extra mile. They may not run their franchise like a baseball team first. It's a business. They go into every season and say, hey, you proved to me that you're committed to winning on the field, then I'll back you as a franchise. And that's what they did this year. They okay Brody Van Wagen in to bring in Marcus Stroman. And I know Joe Paddock and Brad Brock are guys on minimum salary, so it's not like they really added anything. But the Will Ponds, as cheap as they are perceived as, I think there's a little bit of falseness in there. And I think there's a little bit of an overrating when we call them cheap as owners. Antonio Brown, if he doesn't want to play in the National Football League, I'm sure there's a ton of wide receivers that could get some more reps. National Football League is a billion dollar industry, makes billions upon billions of dollars every year and will make just as much money without Antonio Brown if he doesn't want to play in the National Football League. This is a guy that has made this sport all about himself. He basically, uh, you know, sped up his departure from one of the most iconic sports franchises in the history of the sport. He's having problems with the Raiders. He wants to wear a helmet. It's not approved by the league from a safety issue. If he wants to retire, let him go. Let him out. The word gate, so tired of that word being given a definition that it doesn't have. The word gate as a suffix does not mean anything. It's the last part of the word water gate, which was the name of a hotel. We'll be back with you next week. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. This is... The Passball Show brought to you by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey by Two Ways, One Passion Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania on Nayog Avenue and Green Ridge Street. Uh, the number is 570-800-8117. Great setup over there. Really a place that I go to every time I head to Scranton, Pennsylvania. So we'll see if the Mets can continue this run. See how the playoff picture looks in Major League Baseball. Obviously, you got preseason NFL, which I didn't get to speak about today. Um, Be getting more as the season is getting closer. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.